Certainly. I'm just James Dudridge, and I'm a minister in the Department for Exiting the European Union. Thank you very much indeed. Um, why are you on the Isle of Man? Um, I'm on the Isle of Man because the Chief Minister invited me, very kindly. Um, my job is to help the UK exit the European Union on the 31st of October. Uh, clearly, lots of preparations have already happened, um, led by the Chief Minister, his other ministers and uh, departments. So I've come to talk about uh, that. Some of it has been uh, cutting edge, particularly uh, the communications to, to, to citizens. It's some of the best stuff that I've, uh, I've seen uh, in my time uh, as minister. We're also discussing some of the remaining details, contingency details, um, if there isn't going to be a deal. But the Prime Minister has made it very clear he wants a deal. I think a deal is more likely over the last 72 hours. Um, it, it looks more likely to me. Um, and uh, touching on what will happen when we do get a deal, um, and then negotiating a future economic partnership, both with the EU, but also looking at uh, the rest of the world, for example, um, the, the US. And so we're here at the Creamery where um, they export goods to uh, America and understanding the tariff and quota arrangements that uh, are in place uh, now and could be in the future. So making sure the Isle of Man make the most of the opportunities of uh, Brexit and a future economic partnership, be that in the EU or the rest of the world. Six weeks to go until the next proposed deadline, the latest proposed deadline. Haven't you got more important things to be doing than coming to the Isle of Man? No, I think the Isle of Man is incredibly important. Um, so, you know, the Prime Minister is charging, charging around uh, member states, quite rightly, and, and Brussels. My boss, Steve Barclay, has um, been around about five member states over the last five days. Um, and I'm responsible for liaising with Crown Dependencies and a few other uh, entities, part of the, the broader British family. And I think it's really important. And actually one of the strange things that's, that, that's happened is I get a feeling that the relationship, because of the, the difficulties and complexities of the Brexit process over the last three years, three and a half years, uh, let's face it, it hasn't gone smoothly to, to date, has actually brought uh, the two uh, parts of the broader family uh, together more. How well do you feel the Crown Dependencies and the Isle of Man are represented at Westminster and the interests of the Crown Dependencies? Um, well, it's a bit like marking my own homework. So I'm, I'm a bit new to the game, um, but the Chief Minister has said my predecessor was a good friend uh, to the Isle of Man. Uh, we have quarterly meetings. I think you know we, we, we're speaking on a regular basis. We'll share a WhatsApp message or a, a text. I forget forget which. The volume of communication is such, um, but we can we'll continue those regular meetings, in, including the uh, the quarterly. Uh, meetings with the Chief Minister and we'll meet in other forums like the, the British-Irish uh, Council meetings. So not, this isn't a one-off visit and then I go away. This is a beginning of a relationship um, uh, uh, in the 44 days up to Brexit and then beyond in terms of the future economic partnership. Manx people will have read some quite scary things written about Brexit in the UK press. What assurances can you give them that whatever comes from 31st of October any potential negative implications will be will be minimal. So the first thing I say is is we're wanting a deal. Um, second thing I'd say is some of the things that have been read in the press are around no deal. Uh, they are uh, reasonable worst case scenarios that haven't been mit mitigated against. Um, and ministers are meeting on a daily basis and working on a cross, cross Whitehall basis to mitigate against those risks. So quite rightly, we ask civil servants to say, what is the, the reasonable worst case scenario? And then with them, uh, working out how we can mitigate against those. But you know, the, 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 the elephant in the room around these scare stories is, isn't the stories themselves. It's the fact that we're, we're going for a deal. You know, the whole new deal preparation uh, is a contingency in itself. Do, do, you, do you want a deal? Yes. The Prime Minister 100% wants a deal. We're working towards a deal. Um, you know, my last meeting in the office uh, was preparing for what happens after a deal is struck. A deal is agreed by the House of Commons. A second reading goes through. A program motion goes through, and I'll be on the floor of the House and the committee stage taking a, a bill through that will enact. Uh, following on from the European Council. So that is my focus. Because um, not, not too long ago, we were pretty categorically told that had been ruled out, the chances of a new, a new deal, if you like. So you think those chances are, have been revived? Well, I think there was a negotiating uh, stance that the European Commission were taking. In fairness, to Michel Barnier had a mandate to say he couldn't reopen negotiation. Um, the previous British Prime Minister negotiated a deal she could not get through Parliament. 
um, and that left the Europeans a little bit sore. It's taken too long. Um, but the last thing we want is it to go on longer. I think there's a recognition that we need to progress towards a deal and then go, go, go onwards from there, which is why um, I think there was so much traction when, when Boris Johnson uh, and short sh uh, shrift visited um, uh, Angela Merkel and, and, and President Macron. Um, it, then negotiations or discussions started. You know, that's when David Frost Sherpa started going in and out of Brussels um, on, a, on, a, on a Wednesday and Friday and pretty full working days discussing a full range of issues uh, with officials. Howard Quayle, Chief Minister. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think I'm all right to say some fairly glowing praise, actually, from uh, your, your colleague from the UK. What would you reflect on some of the things he said this afternoon? Well, he's been very complimentary about the preparation that the island has done and is doing for, for Brexit. Our document that I was adamant had to be um, easily understood by the general members of the public because at the end of the day, people like myself live and breathe Brexit. But we need to get the concerns and, and what people need to be looking into for their own sake, whether they're going on holiday or an EU citizen living on the Isle of Man, get it over in a language and easily that's easily understood. And I think that's really important. So I, I was very grateful that James felt that we were well prepared, that we understood all the, all the issues and we're working hard to ensure that the Alaman message is, is heard. We cannot direct the traffic or on the way Brexit is going, but we can make sure that the voice of the Isle of Man is heard, our concerns are listened to, and any opportunities that we see through working with our business community are enacted. And when the UK make any f future negotiations, the concerns or, or the views of the Isle of Man, where we see opportunities are taken on board. Can we read into that that the relationship is good? Yes, I, I believe so. I spent three years working hard to build up a really good relationship with Robin Walker and whilst I was very disappointed to see him move on, I was delighted to speak to James. He, he's, uh, I, I spoke to him soon after he'd been appointed into the position and invited him over to the Isle of Man. I'm delighted that he's come over to see us and, and understand the situation. So I'm sure we'll build on a very good relationship and take it forward. Are there any points of friction ever? No, obviously from time to time problems occur and I think it's a speed with which we can fix it and, and move forward. Uh, we're having an extraordinary parliament as a result of changes we need to make in our legislation regarding agriculture to make sure that our farmers can export into the European Union and as a result of if we didn't have that they wouldn't even be able to sell their product into the, Europe, into the United Kingdom. So we've moved quickly to ensure that we have the legislation done before the UK and the Euro European Union have their meeting. That's a commitment I've made. I'm not just doing that for farming. If any other sector of Ireland community is threatened by whatever happens with Brexit and, and the UK leaving the European Union, then we as a government will move quickly to make sure we are well prepared and no sector is unduly affected. By your own admission, um, it's a topic which has defined your, your tenure, your administration. What sort of legacy are you wanting to leave from that? Well, I came into politics to ensure that we had intergenerational fairness, that we, at the time we were hemorrhaging money out, out of our reserves due to the VAT renegotiation. So I still hope that having the books balanced or as close to balanced as possible, sorting out public sector pensions. I was very passionate about introducing the island's first ever mental health strategy, which we've delivered on. And I, I suppose just ensuring that we hand over, my generation hands over a well-run island for our, our, our children and our grandchildren. I hope our visitor didn't think I was being too flippant when I said perhaps he could have better things to be doing than being on the Isle of Man, but it's, a, it's quite a, a bold statement if he's visiting here six weeks before the latest deadline for exiting the European Union, isn't it? It is, but equally it's all about good relationships. You know, I have personally worked very hard to ensure that the Isle of Man concerns are, are known in Westminster and I've built up good working relationship with key politicians, key civil servants. So do you, do you think our voice is heard now? I genuinely believe it is. We, we probably have a, a better relationship with the United Kingdom and the various departments than we have because we've, we're seeing them so often now and there's a good element of trust. They know our concerns and at the end of the day it, it's You've got to do that. We're a small island of 85,000. If I don't get a, go away and, and meet the key people, then we're never going to have the sort of 
position of, of, of where the UK have a level of understanding about the Isle of Man if, if I don't do this sort of work. And it's not just myself, it, it's a team of um, civil servants, officers and various departments too, working behind the scenes to make sure that whatever happens, we are well prepared. Whatever way you throw me, we will stand. We've heard some assurances there that the likelihood of a deal is looking like it's on the up. Does that suit the Isle of Man? Yes, we've always said we wanted a deal. I've prepared the island for the worst case scenario. And, and, what, and what happens in the worst case scenario? Well, we have to, it, you, you're going into uncharted territories. If I knew what was going to happen, you know, we'd all we, be we, billionaires. We, we, we are either way, aren't we, really? Well, as a result of that, it, it's a case of you have those relationships so that if X happens, we find out quickly and then we can discuss it with our, the various industry that's affected by that problem so we can react. So I, I keep on saying it's dodging icebergs and seizing opportunities. And if there are opportunities out there for the people of the Isle of Man, then this administration is going to grab them. Just finally, um, I'm sure it's been an enormously tiring exercise for you as well. Is it how you envisaged your career in Manx politics would, would go? Well, I went into it with an open mind just to achieve good results for the people of the island. I wasn't expecting Brexit. I was thinking I was going to be majoring on balancing the economy and sorting out public sector pensions. Those were my two key areas. Brexit's come along and, you know, you've just got to get on with it, haven't you? There's no point um, complaining. It, it's a major problem. We've got to tackle it. We've got to tackle it well for the sake of the island. And that's why I stood to, to help the island. Is it? Sorry, I know I said finally. That was a lie. <laughs> um, is it inevitable, though, that other, other big issues, you've mentioned a couple there, have to be parked because of this? No, myself and the team have worked exceptionally hard to, I was adamant that no matter what happened over Brexit, the Isle of Man was going to carry on business as usual. So we've been dealing with things like beneficial ownership, um, substance, we, we've had to deal with EU code of conduct group, money val, as well as balancing the economy, growing the economy, growing the skilled workforce. And I hope the people of the Isle of Man can see that we are delivering on those areas too.